Okay, hello there and welcome to The Value of Everything. So today I've got a guest onto the show who is the president of the Pirate Party. His name is Simon Few. And what we're going to discuss today is a lot of issues in relation to copyright and patent rules. But this political party isn't necessarily a one-trick pony. We're going to look into a lot of the other points it's made in its political manifesto. So, hi there, Simon. Thank you very much for coming to the show. Thanks for having me, Charles. All right. So, I put a a big set of questions to you. So, thank you very much for coming to the show and participating in this. So, I just want to get from your perspective, why was the Pirate Party formed in the first place? Well, this this story of how the Pirate Party was formed, which was um, as a political defence in Sweden to the Pirate Bay um, was getting attacked by the government and political movements sort of sprung up in defence of it. They formed uh, originally, firstly, the Pirate Bureau and then the Pirate Party to try to stop the government from banning the Pirate Bay, basically. But in more broadly, it's sort of uh, also just the digital rights realm. There's, we've seen governments use it as a way to uh, change the balance of power between citizens and the state. Uh, with uh, you know, we have uh, mandatory uh, data retention in Australia now. Um, there was a huge push to have uh, the internet censored, um, and a lot of these things have sort of been. Um, on the cards and the sort of needed to be a response to that sort of politically. So it's a, a kind of like a, it's like a freedom party in a sense, isn't it? It's like people understand that there's new technology that's coming about and it's really starting to encroach on people's freedoms. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, very much civil libertarian and sort of look for the advantage, um, look at ways of sort of sharing information sort of makes everyone richer rather than locking it up in um, being richer to the making a few people richer. Thanks for that, Simon. Um, so I just, from your side, what's, uh, well, from, uh, I'd like to understand how you got involved in the Pirate Party in itself and uh, what was your motivation? Well, I'm a musician, so um, I've been interested in the sort of copyright issue uh, and just the possibilities for distribution that the internet sort of um, makes available to everyone was uh, I thought was a really good way to change the sort of way the music industry worked, where rather than have a handful of huge um, companies control what people can act, what music people could access, um, the internet sort of democratized that. Um, and I've just been generally interested in stuff like Linux and um, the free software movement just as it um, came into existence. Yeah, I mean, I, I was, um, at one stage, I was thinking of uh, building a new PC for myself and uh, I was going to go the Linux route and then I was just like, oh, I could have done it, but then like some, even the hardware wasn't going to work out for the PC and then I just sort of gave up in the end, but um, it's good of you to just sort of get yourself involved in uh, more free source, um, well, open source software. I think there's a lot of potential for um, people to be able to collaborate with the internet um, to build things that are just for uh, the good for every, by access accessible for everyone. Just out of the fact that we need it, um, so people who have can make it, you know, donate time to make that. So, 
if you could like define, I know, I know we've spoken a little bit about it and um, briefly beforehand about like the libertarian side, but um, what are the main principles that the Pirate Party have got their interests in? Well, um, we're very much a civil libertarian party, um, particularly around digital rights, but also we're uh, interested in uh, sort of intellectual property was uh, sort of free speech issues, uh, anti-censorship, sort of away from the technology side of things where um, we sort of look to look after sort of the worse off while um, trying to do it through more community-centred uh, ways rather than just relying on big government to do everything. Uh, so it's like a kind of um, decentralist kind of ideology in some ways. Uh um, yeah, I want to see uh, more power in the hands of the community. Uh, we've got a shift in power at the moment um, where the government is um, becoming more and more overbearing and companies are getting more access to more and more information and uh, more power needs to be brought back into the hands of ordinary citizens. Uh, I want to just know a little bit about the party itself because uh, I imagine being in the side of the perspective that you're on on the political spectrum, you've got to... Ext- a variety of views it goes into a sort of a, a camp of uh we want freedom we don't want um oppressive authority to decipher all of those um opinions and get to a actual single voice that sounds um quite complicated now i hear that your party's got a, a new kind of system of delegating votes and uh, popularities of decision making, and I just wanted, I, I found that a little bit interesting. Could you um, explain how that happens? We don't have a fully functional system at the moment. We just we basically just do voting like an ordinary party with everyone having a say. Um, internationally, the Pirate Party, other Pirate Parties have used uh, liquid democracy, which um, is just the vote delegation and being able to sort of choose what issues to delegate the votes to different people on, which uh, has been interesting to watch, but we decided not to take it up because you could see a lot of few problems where people weren't paying attention to what their votes were doing. Yep. And in um, a couple of parties overseas, uh, the cliques formed, where they worked out that between them they controlled over 50% of the vote and then they just ruled it as an <laughs> oligarchy. And um, Yeah, it was really problematic for everyone outside of that small group. Yeah, um, so the, the, the power starts to corrupt, regardless of uh, how small the political party is. Yeah, yeah. So we keep ours to just kind of a formal voting process. Our um, policies are worked out. We have policy development committee and people just ask to be on it. We just approve everyone pretty much who's a member of the party. And people were always invited to come and have a say on whatever issues that they have opinions on. All right, okay. I'm just going to ask you another um, curveball question here. Out of curiosity, what kind of um, music do you prefer to listen to? Do you like to listen to the live artist or the recorded version? Definitely prefer uh, live artist. Well, it's kind of a mix. It's kind of mixed with electronic music. Sometimes when you see an act, they are just pretty much playing the recorded tracks. Yeah. That's still better, I think. Yeah, I I guess it's a bit of a trick question. Sometimes for me, I I like a... um, you probably can't ever you, you can't be a live artist if they're the best and they're there at the peak and they're singing like uh, without any of like the the computers in the background helping them out and uh keying making sure their voice is singing key but um if you're going to have consistency probably the recorded version is always going to be a bit better isn't it just cuz it's like been mastered and balanced in the right way yeah, um, yeah, definitely uh, to the year. I guess I enjoy going to concerts more, though, so the actual sound quality isn't as important as the experience. having fun, I suppose, yeah. Yeah. All right, okay, so now we're going to go a little bit into like the whole theory behind um, piracy in itself. Oh, it's a question that I think is fundamental to the Pirate Party. To what extent should a person own an idea? Basically, the only way someone can really own an idea is to never tell anyone else the idea. Um, <laughs> because as soon as you tell someone else, then that's uh, someone else that knows the idea and they can go and tell the next person and then it just starts spreading if it's a good idea. 
in terms of having intellectual property generally, I think there's sort of a, some justification in some circumstances for people to be able to have a sort of limited time to use an idea before it goes to the public. But generally, I sort of think at the moment it's all geared too far, like geared to for sort of culture or um, technology to be held for too long by the companies. Right. And sometimes, um, like particularly with patents, there's a lot of patents that people take out just for licensing purposes that they have no intention of using, and they just use it to go and collect royalties off anyone that uses that idea, which is sort of rent-seeking that just basically drains money out of the economy and into their pockets. So... So then, the, uh, and obviously, the, there might be some divergences between all the different pirate parties and stuff like that. But I'll, I'll have to sort of angle my questions to you for the meantime. But when it comes to an idea that, if it's a very unique idea and it's, um, and it, you believe that there should be some kind of reward for that idea, it depends. So if it's like for like a making a sort of a better phone or something like that. They should have a sort of limited monopoly to exploit that for, you know, 15 years is uh, what we argue is the correct length of term. Yeah. And um, after that, it becomes public domain and can be used by anyone. Right. And so, say, for example, with, uh, with music, and just been reading through the policy notes as well, is that the f- and I've listened to a couple of people speak about piracy, but there's a difference between um, in, in the way that is perceived of selling an idea and just um, sharing an idea so when it comes to selling an idea you believe that that person should have some kind of protective rights I mean you can correct me at any point here but if that person is going to be just sharing that idea with somebody else there's no uh, kickback there's no fee for that then you think there really shouldn't be any kind of um, criminal recourse to that person uh no this should not it's the way culture is transmitted is through people sharing what they like or through what you you have kind of that or listening to like uh, consuming mass media. Uh, we think that being able to share culture is just the natural way that culture sort of gets spread around and people want to share their songs. Like they only want to share songs they love. They're like, oh, listen to this. This is great. You know, and that, if the song is good and people do like it, then that sort of becomes a like a way to expand your audience, a way to find and have new people listen to your stuff. Yeah. So you see, there's like a there's a value in return. Like it, it, they might not get anything in direct uh, proceeds for selling copies of their material or their music, but in another way, they build p- publicity. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. A lot of the time, uh, there's a lot more money in selling the experience than sort of, you know, what's shared. So for set music, the, there's more money in, and more enjoyment in going to a concert than listening to a recording. That's where the money should sort of come from more. Yeah, I mean, there's other ways to make money from music, but I think, yeah, that sort of gets to all um, any, any entertainment. But that's sort of the, you're sort of selling the experience rather than just the sort of, you know, bunch of zeros and ones on a computer right so in this scenario say theoretically if i sell a song to one person and then they share it for free to this mates that could get worldwide distribution but basically the producer or me i only get one royalty for that song you're fine with that um yeah i think the with that song you can go and play it somewhere and if it's got worldwide distribution to like millions of people there's you know thousands of people will turn up in any city that you play in and <laughs> yeah. give you money to see you so you know it works that way yeah all right okay so i think you you lightly uh, mentioned this beforehand but say if i'm a music producer and uh, i'm i'm selling uh, to an audience how long should I own the copyright to music? And is there different categories according to whether it's music or whether it's like um, I'm, I've made a medicine? Is there different rate durations of time that somebody should own copyright or selling? Well, we argue that it should just be uh, 15 years across the board to 
to harmonize the different areas of intellectual property because uh, at the moment um, patent law is completely different to copyright law trademarks are completely different but trademarks there's a sort of whole different issue that we don't really have a problem with because people you know when you make something it's, it should be perfectly fine for you to be able to say i made this here's the you know stamp of approval this comes from me and that way you um your sort of skills and your spot your organization brings to the table is what you're actually selling yep okay so um what about like because uh, because you've already alluded to one point where by like the and I think this change is already happening anyway, but you mentioned how like artists need to pretty much adapt to the new environment and that is a share environment, and maybe they new artists really need to think about their live performances and bringing the crowds to the shows so that might just adapt to their style in itself. They everyone can't be sitting behind computers all the time they need to have that public performance as well like what's going to happen also to the like the environments that could change with shared distribution so what about your big production movies if everybody pirates those on a uh, file share networks what's going to happen to that kind of operation is it just gonna have to be all of these uh cart house movies and stuff like is it is that the face because i don't i mean I don't know, between you and me simon like i actually liked um like high production value music like 80s music where there was tons and tons of money in it and probably tons of copyright and all those kind of things and i did like a lot of like the the hollywood movies of the era now i do tend to like a lot of the the B movies and horror movies as well, but I did like the some of the big Hollywood productions. But are you just saying that that era is going to go away and we're just going to have to get used used to a new sort of grassroots norm? Ah, uh, not at all. So I'm not entirely sure of last year, but over the last five years, at least three of those years have been the highest ever takings at the box office for films. So. Despite the fact that file sharing is readily available, the our movie industry is flourishing like never before. So I, I think with that, and I think that happens because um, most of the money from films is made back at the actual box box office. So again, like concerts, you're selling the experience of going along, sitting there with like you know a hundred other people and watching a film. Yeah. All right, so that is, I think that's an um, interesting point, but like, I don't know, like, have you ever seen with the, these movies and stuff, I always feel like they're churning out massive budget movies, and I feel like if one of them have a, a couple of big flops, like, I don't think they're the way that they're structured at the moment. They can't handle these big flops too much. I, I've been watching, like, the, the last two Star Wars movies, and I feel like if they keep on churning out these Star Wars movies, I feel like one of them's going to have to flop eventually. And I just, uh, I feel sometimes the Hollywood, um, the whole system in itself, they're uh, sitting up on matchsticks almost. Yeah, um, they're very much challenged by Netflix, for example, where yeah. there's a lot of people who are quite happy to pay for Netflix. It's way better than pirating TV. I have Netflix and it's just, you know, whatever I want to watch on tap pretty much. Yeah. It's really good. So they, they're making good films. So that's kind of a sort of challenge to Hollywood. I think Hollywood has has a problem where they've got the formula down on how they make the movies, but then they just do it sort of... But that kind of ruins the movie, if you know what I mean. They do a calculation of how many bums are going to go on seats. They do, uh, like, audience uh, checks, and they edit it, and they keep on surveying it. But it, yep. it doesn't necessarily, it just becomes like this big, it's like a big survey and it tries to appease to every single audience. But when it comes to art, it's a very individualist thing, isn't it, in some ways? And it really counts to the director or the writer to put out their art in their view and to upset a few people and to really captivate a few other, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, um, that's right. I think the focus groups and the um, polling of getting testing or audience testing and stuff is part of like what just sort of makes it really bland. It's a lot like the major parties in Australia. They they sort of have fallen into the same trap of focus group testing everything and 
going, oh, so what do the swing voters in marginal seats say here? We'll go and do a focus group and then, oh, we'll change our policy to win that little group over. Yeah. But it's the same with the film where they're like, oh, we need this audience to come, so we'll go focus group that audience where do you, and then change the film to suit whatever their, you know, handful of people that watch it actually, you know, say. Yeah. You said it's something quite interesting as well beforehand by the fact that it almost like the the audience dictated that they liked file sharing and they liked, well, not necessarily file sharing, that's probably a bit of a, a nuisance, but they liked mass media, they liked it to get their uh, their movies digitally downloaded, they want it easy, they want to have it accessible. And as a consequence of that freedom that happened, because it a, a new company came on the scene, Netflix, and they've sort of tapped into that kind of market, would you say? There's that, that freedom sort of almost suggested that we like media, we don't mind paying for it as long as the price is reasonable and uh, as long as you can provide good content, then that's, uh, that's workable for us. So it's almost like uh, the freedom of the pirate party almost highlights the stuff that the market even wants. Yeah, definitely. One of the things I found in debating the copyright lobby over the years is they just don't want to change the formula. They don't want to change their business models. They just want to keep going as is. Um, and they refuse to sort of like even just having sort of films come out at the same time and globally is something they're really resistant to. Um, and that's sort of what has driven you know, the people file sharing and, you know, downloading films and sharing them and stuff because, and TV, TV shows too, where, you know, everyone was pirating Game of Thrones to start off with because to get it, to not have it ruined by your friends overseas, you had to watch it straight away. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it took, took a, like three or four seasons for them to cotton onto this and start selling individual episodes uh, and with sort of global release times. Yeah. Um, I think Netflix is, you know, gone well that's what people want we'll provide it to them and sort of old media companies are very slow to take that up and they you know every day they delay their sort of digging their graves a little bit deeper okay so um what does something a little bit more like um obviously when we talk about copyright is it, it doesn't it doesn't seem like a much of a crime if you're sharing music it doesn't seem much of a crime if you're sharing uh uh your movies as well but when we're talking about something that's in the realm of life and death, like uh, healthcare, and if you're a drug producer, there's there's a lot more nuances and aspects to consider, and particularly if you're a drug company and you're producing, say, a cure for cancer, there's a significant amount of research analysis that needs to be to that, and you could be investing. It is, it's, it's a very complicated matter. You need to invest years into that research. So what do you say in that terms? Is it just the 15-year the mark and that applies to everything or is there, is there other aspects to consider? Well, when we've discussed this as sort of one of the areas where we think that just the government's just going to have to invest more money in our research and development, and the government already funds a lot of this um, research for new drugs and medicines and they don't necessarily keep the patents on them. So it's just be a matter of we sort of uh, our sort of we think you know direct investment to you know solve you know I do research on cancer for example. Uh, also, we think that we could uh, encourage research by um, offering bounties if you can cure this disease, for example. We will give put up two billion dollars, and then companies have something to work for with the goal of winning the bounty interesting when you mentioned uh the the research side of things so let's say if i was a company and i said look i got this project here it's we're gonna have to invest a lot of money into this one we're not even sure whether it's going to pan out or anything but really for this investment it's going to take care of and for the the price we can't sell this drug for anything more than like for, we'll have to sell it for at least like a hundred dollars a go and we're gonna to have to uh it has to be used weekly and it's like all these kind of things they need all these factors and this price cost analysis that occurs and then they go to you okay well we need more than 15 years 
to do this? Do you just say, okay, well, like, we, we can't let that happen? Do, do we have to go to the government to get funding for it? Or do we need to ascertain like, and get a certain level of your requirements to get that bounty? Is I just want to see how that kind of plays out. Um, It's hard to know exactly because we haven't had the chance to, you know, try any of these things out. Um, But basically we think that the patent length is enough to um, make your money back if it's, uh, you know, a, uh, an effective drug. Um, but there would be opportunities to apply for grants, to apply to win bounties if they can, you know, fix certain problems and, you know, still access all the research from universities and, uh, yeah, like the you know, scientific organizations. Yeah. So um, I just want to, because I'm actually probably the extreme side of where the Pirate Party lies. I almost say to a certain extent that the copyright rules, the patent rules should be highly liberated and there almost should be an environment where people are, are free to share any kind of idea and um, compete. And there's, there's these new realms where even these big software companies are saying like this project's open source, get involved, write the code, continue on, see where it goes, take us from there. So do you ever see party members like that on that side of thing? Just to say, well, let's, let's see what happens if we just take away the 15 years. There's no copyright rulings whatsoever, that total free liberated market. And then what could happen after that is that people and, uh, like obviously every time there's a copyright you've got a monopoly to sell something but in just like a free open market territory you've got trademarks you've got not legal trademarks but just general trademarks you've got branding so you can make your products look very unique and you can have a holographic logo which is hard to copy you be the first one onto the scene so even if i am that drug company and i produce that drug I'm still selling it, so they've still other people have to back backwards engineer it to get it out. So there's that, there's that delay time against the competitors. Um, you've got um, independent review, so different companies can review these companies to say, look, this company is a great, um, it's doing a great product, um, tested it, and um, this is the really like a, a good product should almost sell for itself. Um, You've got collaborative research, which I, I touched on a little bit beforehand. There's crowdfunding grants. So as you say before, you could have a bounty to produce something. Um, and then there's other items where you could have um, two parties saying, look, I'll produce something for you and um, you pay me this money. Here's the, like, we'll, we'll sign a contract for doing this. So. There's agreeable contracts that can create that monopoly of the products there, um, personalizing the product, making it more bespoke, and then you can just generally make it harder and more complicated to copy. So if I produced a iPhone out like 30 years ago, like the whole world would be quite baffled by it. So there's all these areas. Isn't that just enough alone rather than having to legislate uh, law instead? Um personally probably on your side of this but we're sort of you know a political party and sort of some of all the different sort of opinions um there's definitely the uh, anti-intellectual property sort of i don't know we wouldn't say we're a faction or anything but there's certainly the sort of the tendency of thought within the pirate party that thinks all intellectual property is a bit um iffy at best yeah and other than you know, impersonating artists and um, sort of a respect of moral rights. That's about as far as I think, you know, I'm. I, that's my sort of personal opinion is that if you just have, you know, respect of moral rights, not impersonating someone else, then everything else is fairly, should be fairly open as far as I'm concerned. But, um, yeah, I have to represent an organisation too, so. <laughs> well, that's, that's fair enough. And obviously, um, as being part of the pirate party i'm sure that area is probably more openly debated than anywhere else i mean i'm sure there's no 
um, Labour Party that are talking about this, these kind of topics. And um, it really does need to be spoken about. I mean, I've mentioned before, like how if you really need somebody to go out there and send a lawyer and a file suit to chase after people, you, you, you're going back to like these kind of laws, these old laws of like the slave trade almost where you we own slaves and every once in a while a slave um, escapes so then we get the uh, slave catcher to go out there pick up the slave bring it back so it's the the monopoly and trying to keep that monopoly of of these workers for us it's the same thing but just in in in, a, in the frame of an idea so this is the thing like if we don't we've never experienced really so much of an environment where there has been no copyright rules but as i lay it out there there are there are ways to create personalized monopolies but and people can adapt to that market so how you mentioned beforehand about netflix gets created on the back of of a file sharing network idea and in a, in a realm of no copyrights there's a, a whole different world of how people can personalize and digitalize ideas that really won't ever be discovered until the liberation of those laws yeah, I personally, yeah, would like to see it completely open up. Um, the I think sort of you you know, a look at it how it would work with the free software movement where IDs are just forked. So as soon as someone goes, I think this feature is more important than that feature, and they go off and build it, and um, the team can split in two, and then there's just two of the same thing that exists side by side. If one's really popular and the other one isn't, you know, everyone slowly migrates to the popular one, but if they people like the different features and some you know it's perfectly reasonable for the two things to just continue on yeah so um so another thing that's a that's kind of a little bit of a gripe as well and i just wonder if the pirate party's got a view on this is that you know when you get licensing so if you've got a license you've almost got a monopoly to do a certain trade now what's your perspective on that and obviously there's extensions of this like you know where companies have these excessive terms and conditions and you're reading through all this information and you just you bother to just turn over the pages and sign at the bottom like how do you see these things i know they're two totally different things but so confusing paperwork and then on the other side somebody's got the right to i don't know cut hair in a hairdresser's i mean there's silly licenses for everything nowadays so what's the Pirate Party's uh, perspective on these things? I don't think we've ever really discussed uh, licensing that much. The terms and conditions we've definitely discussed in a lot of detail because there's a lot of issues, especially around sort of the huge things you get whenever you sign up to a new product online. You sort of go, oh, it's a wall of text. I'll just agree and yeah. move on without really, you know, reading it. We sort of think that like it's a really bad practice that the companies are in. We don't really have a specific policy or solution to it, but the agreements have to sort of be in line with Australian law that any inf any time a company like uses your public information, your information that, that you have to know about, or you don't have to get informed every time. But you have to be clearly clearly know that they're going to use that information for how long and that it gets deleted and you can request for should be able to request for them to delete that information so kind of you know try to like give consumers more power in the face of these great huge contracts but that's about like is that the only solution we have at the moment yep and uh, i think we'll, we'll touch upon surveillance uh, a little bit down the road so um another question for you would you say that the pirate party is anti-corporation uh no we're not an anti-corporation we're um anti-rent seeking we think that anywhere where there's a you know a, like a scarce resource that can be held so that it should be taxed pretty heavily or you know very heavily restricted in what ways it can be um kept as monopoly so like Copyrights, one, uh, and so intellectual property is one we've already talked about yeah. um, in a lot of detail, but it you know, sort of goes into like uh, land access and stuff like that. Like, we think there should be a lot more sort of tax on land because they're all, um, you know, monopolies of, you know, one block of land right next to that train station or whatever. It's worth a lot. Um, they should have to pay greater tax for that monopoly on that, you know, nice piece of land. And that should 
you know, deal like sort of tax that monopoly. Maybe a a better one would be say like uh, energy, for example. So uh, any energy companies that have got a bit more of a monopoly on the market, maybe there should be some kind of uh, taxation system that should be fairer to the citizens. Yeah, definitely. Although we, as you can see with energy, that's becoming more and more decentralized as um, access to solar panels just gets cheaper and cheaper. Um, a lot of people can are starting to be able to power their homes at least some of the time. Yeah. All right. So we mentioned this uh, beforehand about the uh, a movement of decentralization now that obviously had its a little bit more of its roots in um, file sharing, but. With a, a, a political party, obviously you're seeking authority, you're seeking votes, and uh, it's a majority rule system. Why would a decentralizing movement, almost like an anti authoritarian movement, seek authority? Well, basically, it's the easiest way to uh, weaken authorities to take a hold of it and start deconstructing it where the alternatives to be sort of revolutionary movement, which would be overthrowing the system, but that's uh, always, you know, history shows that's a bit of a rough path for yeah. society to go. So just try to win elections and then use that to, you know, lessen the power of the state over the citizens, like with so it's it, politics. So you're doing it the uh, the honest, friendly way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's seems the most sensible way to go about these things. If you want more liberties and the government's trying to take them away, try to take over the government and then really get the liberties. Right. Okay, so now this doesn't necessarily mean um, directly to do with uh, copyright. There are other applications of this, uh, what I'm trying to say here, but if the majority um, perpetrate a crime, so the majority of the citizens of the nation, under what circumstances should the law still be enforced? This is a bit of a tough one. Um, there are like circumstances where I think it really becomes where something like this would actually be sort of necessary, sort of um, speeding with cars, whilst the sort of most people probably just speed a bit. You know, the thing that stops you from going really fast is the fact that you get a big speeding ticket. Yeah. Where it's a matter of like. You know, serious public safety, safety that, harm, things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that that should be enforced because, like, that's uh, when I when I was sort of yeah, saw this question, I was like, oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, literally, the only um thing I could think of was yes, yeah, being tickets and being an example of this where law enforcement's probably warranted, despite the fact most people do it. There's another little undertone of like um of morality as well. So if the public at large were persecuting individuals and stuff like that, I guess maybe there's there's certain things where the law should still stick up for those in minorities. But then also this does branch into another thing about say if everybody you know takes drugs, I know a lot of people drink and if that's a drug and but it's legalized, but a lot of the people take recreational drugs, say marijuana, things like that. If majority does that kind of thing, should the law still be enforced for those things? So let's just take drugs, for example. How what's the perspective on that? Well, I personally in favor of uh, legalization of anything that isn't uh, harmful and then just kind of decriminalize the uh, more harmful drugs like heroin and uh, ice and so the users aren't punished aren't treated as criminals but like are given access to health services and rehabilitation services if they need them but where i think where the problem is is the like with it's sort of with the harder drugs is just that they are very damaging and it's hard to control yeah. with like um i think you need to have health professionals kind of oversee what sort of level of controls placed on drugs rather than just do it as a sort of law and order crime thing make it a health issue and then deal with it yeah. as a health issue yeah I see, I see exactly where you're coming through on this but just like you know what your standard politician's going to say is that well it's not necessarily like these people who take drugs or have been found with drugs get very severe sentences the whole reason why it's there is it's a preventative measure. It stops the access to all access for children as well. 
And really, if you just say, okay, well, there's nothing really that bad that's going to happen to you. We're just going to get you to speak to a shrink. That's just going to open the floodgates. And before you know it, everyone's going to be living in meth towns. So uh, how would you come back at that? Well, it's been done in Portugal um, very effectively where they have put in pretty much what I've sort of outlined as their policy. And there's a lot of um, money they've saved also being put into education. And through that, they've actually um, seen a sharper decline in um, drug use and that's happened in the tough on crime jurisdictions. Yep. And obviously, you got the, you can you got the prohibition as well, um, whereby you know, when it gets to be made illegal, it gets you get the uh, illicit crime, the the underground gets involved in it more and more. Uh, once you make it more legal and reasonable, and people can see if somebody's acting out, uh, then it when when it becomes part of a a culturally watched system, not an underground system, then things can act a bit more reasonably. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right. Okay. So now, uh, touching on like privacy, because I know the Pirate Party does uh, look into a lot of these subjects. When is censorship good? Basically, we're opposed to censorship across the board where crimes have happened. So sort of the sort of sexual abuse videos are, you know, people being cruel to dogs, stuff like that. The video should, should be taken down, used as evidence, and the perpetrators punished. If you do away with censorship and just use it as a way to, where things are illegal, close them down. And well, I suppose that is sort of a mild censorship. Um, but still, like the work, yeah, it's generally only criminal activities that should be banned. Yeah. All right. So, let's say, for example, with censorship, there's a couple of things. It's like when it comes to ideas and anything that's like uh, maybe something that questions the government in itself, that, that should still be open, would you always say? Oh, most definitely. The government needs to be criticised, the government needs to be criticised by their workers, the government needs to be criticised by anyone who feels uh, aggrieved. Um, we live in a democracy and the only way we're going to get a fair representation of the will of the people is for the people to have all the information available. So we are also opposed to stuff like the information blackout on the our refugee detention centres. We think that if we could see what was going on, the conditions would either be a lot better or people would be free. Yeah. It's the secrecy that, you know, oppression flourishes under, needs to be done away with. And you, you mentioned about, like, say, uh, cruelty. Now, if there is something where cruelty may be, if, if there's some kind of material where people could actually, like, uh, turn it into a money spinner, you know where I'm talking about, like, paedophilia and things like that, or cruelty to animals, that kind of stuff, then there is an idea of the from the Pirates Party's perspective to censor those kind of things and to shut them down and prosecute them. Yes, definitely. The um, shutting them down and prosecuting them. Um, but you, because... you wouldn't like leave their stuff online still. Oh, no, no, totally. No, that needs to be taken down. Then that's used as evidence to get them. Yeah, it should be taken down for sure. Yeah. Um, it's a matter of a sort of. Ideal, like we, we sort of ideally we'd hope that whatever any country in the world would arrest people hosting that material and shut down the website. Um, yeah. But not, I assume most governments, well, pretty much every government would. So, yeah. Um, but that would be the ideal solution to rather than actually blocking websites. But you know, if we have to block websites, just as few as possible. Yeah. So, so just like generally, you you really want uh, criminal proceedings to run its course, really. And uh, but let's just say, for example, okay, so because it is is a very tricky subject at the best of times. Say, say there's a foreign website that is, and we've got like the we got the pirate party's version of the of the uh, the internet, which is basically full reigns, no censorship, censorship, anything like that. Can anybody just access all this material, which is basically shows cruelty to people, or is there still some kind of firewall when it comes to that kind of stuff? Well, at the moment, it's fairly there's not much censorship at all. There's anything 
Now, like our government only blocks a handful of websites that I know about. It's generally about, uh, like there's a sort of, uh, what's it called, the Interpol list, which is all the sort of sort of globally sort of blocked websites. And then besides that, it's just malware sites pretty much. And um, sort of anything that's a bit scammy, or very scammy, I should say. Yeah. Although... They're really bad at it, and there's been cases of over blocking, and it's like because no one knew what was going on. Everyone thought websites were being censored because they targeted. Uh, I think it was a dentist who had their website hacked and was being used as some sort of phishing scam. Yeah, and it got blocked, but they blocked two hundred thousand other websites. One of which was uh, Melbourne Free University, and. They'd done some fairly controversial topics on their free university course and um, people thought the website was censored. And it came out a couple of days after a couple of days of a bit of a media frenzy about it came out that it was inadvertently blocked because of the blocking method they'd used on the dentist. Uh, okay. All right. Well, it's, it's a very it's a very tangly legal situation when it comes to censorship. But it's, it's interesting to see your... Your views on that. Now, um, what's your opinion on Google and Facebook changing algorithms to censor determined fake news or just giving people what they think people should be seeing? Because obviously, if if I type in something, oh, what's going on in the war over here? And I get given what maybe the material is deemed is true. But again, it's very it gets very complicated, especially when it becomes political what is true, what is not. There's two different divided opinions of all different matter of aspects. So these massive corporations, they almost can pick and choose how the information is run. And, okay, maybe they use good sources and good information. What's the perspective on that? I think it's uh, it's not a kind of complicated issue. A lot of the fake news that was going on in the U.S. election was just purely done for... Some of it was sort of propaganda that seems to might have come from sort of like people working for foreign powers like the Russians. Um, but a lot of it was actually just people running clickbait to get advert sell advertising. And they made like, you know, if they had an article that picked up 100,000 reshares, that's... Um, you know, and uh, ten thousand. I'm not sure I'm making up money numbers here, but it's like a good chunk of money in their bank balance. So if you can just create the right headline that makes people, you know, share and keeps the outrage going. Yeah. Uh, so I think as long as the uh, way they do it is transparent and um, with good reviewing software. Yeah, such an understanding. What I, I've thought of before as well is the fact that. Uh, customers and people like it, it's dodgy in itself the fact that you've got these just one single source that everybody uses to check the internet on uh, it should be a little bit more of a competitive market there but even that alone when somebody does a search it shouldn't be just simply one button and that's it uh, you should be able to select the algorithm could be a, a rip like an algorithm of where this word has been found the most where is the most popular pages for this word? Like you can set up your own algorithm and let it search properly in accordance to uh, a mathematical search, rather than having somebody in the background choosing what is true and what is not. Yeah, um, I guess that might work. Um, I think with the yeah, I think with what's shared on Facebook, it may. Maybe just going as far as going, you know, this this article is dodgy or something across the bottom. Probably, disclaimers, yeah, yeah. yeah disclaimers um, probably be enough because even you know, I don't know. It's kind of because it's a sharing service. It's sort of people should have the like expect that what they post goes to their friends. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a tough one. Like, I yeah. want to be in their shoes and how you decide it. Yeah, and obviously I've been trying to speak from one side of the argument. The other, obviously, the other, the other side is the fact that I could be just firing out all this false information, and really, if I'm a popular person and I've got all these like these negative views, I could just be putting like like, like I could be saying, oh, Simon of the Prison of the Pirate Party, he's this, he's that." And if I'm more popular, then based upon my popularity, I can. 
uh, I can dethrone people and stuff. So in that way, it's kind of wrong that somebody that's too popular should overthrow people with their opinions. And obviously people are more guided on what they want to believe rather than what is the truth. So you got all these problems of and these these hazardous uh, subjects which come up up when it comes to like even just the something something as simple as a search engine result because it, obviously you're, you're looking at the feed it's it's not like the old days nails where where currently we just have one search engine and that's it and in the old days we would speak to a family we'd speak to friends we'll go to the library we'll check things up and the media would have source material, the education system would have sources feeding back to, well, reputable sources generally. Nowadays, it's different on that on that playing field and uh, where it's more of a popularity contest and clickbait, the realm is very different. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, I think this the whole subject is going to get more prevalent as time progresses. Yeah, I think there sort of needs to be a bit more of a thought. Maybe there is, um, but needs people need better skills at critical thinking. I mean, most, most people I go on, like, use Facebook, for example. Most, most of my Facebook friends are fairly intelligent, but I've got a few friends that are really, really bad at spotting dodgy source, and they just share stuff, and you sort of go, what? You know, and sort of talk to them about it, like, oh, I didn't know, and they just um, don't have the filter or, like, the ability, in, I need to check this. You know, this sounds too good or bad to be true. I better check if this is real. They yeah. just kind of go, oh, share. And then you go, oh, I don't think that's true. <laughs> um, yeah, so I want to talk about this as something that's uh, obviously you can tell that I've got a, a London accent to me, but I'm uh, living here in Sydney and uh, I notice what's unfolding. I, I've noticed this happening in, in London anyway beforehand, but. We seem to be, uh, well, in the midst of a property bubble. I feel like everywhere you look in the newspapers, there's bad news, bad news. The regulators want to change things. It's gonna, the RBA doesn't want to raise interest rates, even though the market is really bubbling out of control. People are outbidding each other. The auction clearance rates are always showing good figures. Um, it's, it, there's a weird paradigm. You've got these investors that keep on flipping these houses, doing really well. And then on the other side, there's the general public, the young people as well, especially, they can't afford even rent, let alone a, a million dollar house nowadays. So what's your opinion of that? What is, what's going on with um, the housing market? Uh, are these affordability things is that a hoax like um every like you, you speak to a mainstream politician nowadays they say oh we want to just increase supply but i don't see that that's going to really be the answer to any of these issues yeah um our well, we have a policy to phase out negative gearing over five years which would um definitely help deal with the um people just using properties and investment yeah beyond that the i think one of the biggest problems um this um, we don't have any policies in this area, but sort of from a personal perspective, I think the most one of the things that could be done to, to help, particularly with rent, is to make uh, empty properties available to renters. Yeah. Um, just by law, where you can't, if you have a place that's empty, it needs to be on the market, and people need to be able to rent that. Um, because at the moment, there's literally tens of thousands of vacant properties in Sydney and Melbourne that are just there for investment purposes and they're just there to collect money as they gain in value and then get sold off to suckers, you know, five years in the future. And just being able to open up the housing that's already there would solve a lot of the, the cost of rent and stuff like that would immediately just kind of have a massive downward pressure on it. Yeah. If you think about our parents' generation, they, they could quite happily afford a house you you might even just have one work at home the man just goes to work um and uh, you could afford a nice i don't know two bedroom three bedroom house and everything would tick away quite smoothly nowadays you need two people work full time fairly high paying job and you're just about making ends meet when it comes to buying a like a million dollar house it's a crazy situation that we've got over here yeah, we definitely think that just the easiest way to deal with that is to 
yeah, get rid of negative gearing, uh, it's kind of the cause of it all where there's people buying a first house don't get any tax breaks, but if you want a second or a third, then you get a tax break. And it's um, just kind of obscene for people who can't get into the market that someone buying their second house gets a better deal than I do buying my first. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so um, with corporations and stuff, like, you know, when you're, uh, you're entering your information to Facebook and, and Google, should they be able to store your personal data? Uh, for a limited time, with your knowledge and with your ultimate control, um, yes, they should. So, so that so the pirate party is perfectly fine with um, companies using your your information if it's like a, an agreeable kind of contract. Yeah, yeah, and that you can withdraw their ability to use your data if you so choose. Now, say if that corporation um, sells that information to somebody else, is that okay? No, not generally, although certainly they do. A lot of like of the big companies like Google and Facebook generally just try to use that data to monetize it through advertising where the smaller companies are much more likely to sell it for cash. Okay, and l- let me just uh, twist that one a bit more for you. Um, say Google or whoever's got your personal data are they allowed to use that personal data to sell things better to you? So, if it, for example, your buying habits and stuff like that, to really understand you better, they can sell you the product better. Is that fine? Because obviously this, this is, there's a certain element of privacy, isn't there? You know, that's the cost of using their products, really. That's what they're selling. You know, um, anything that's free on the internet, you're the product. And that's how they provide it for free, really. I think it can, can be problematic. It's just one of those things that if you want the free service, you know, there's a sort of the cost of coming with it is getting targeted marketing. The selling of their data is a lot more, like, a lot more problematic and it can become a lot more, pro- like, advertising can become a lot more problematic um, foreseeably in the future. Like, when, say, for example, everyone starts wearing sort of Google Glass equivalents, companies could just put, advertising on the street and wherever you walk there's always like 3g projections in augmented reality of you know ads yeah and yeah that could get a bit much probably um but you know as as it is at the moment it's not too big a problem it's mainly the potential for it to become a problem that's concerning yeah okay yeah so for the for the meantime when it's all like uh la da we're just trying to sell you stuff on amazon it's not a big deal but down the line when people start knowing a lot more about your habits then that starts to become a bit more of an issue so just in general like if i'm not doing any wrong why should i worry about the government or anybody else surveilling me well basically it's just harmful for society to for people to be under constant surveillance so with the government for example if you know the government's listening on your conversations you might be less inclined to say how much you hate the government um or how much you hate certain policies uh you start self-censoring and this uh, becomes a thing that distorts the public debate because people kind of start to think that they're always in public and always on show and therefore the way they act interact with the rest of the world sort of becomes sort of has to become stage managed so you become like an actor rather than you know just a person person, in your life yeah yeah good answer so yes i wouldn't say that you're you're a big fan of the nsa i would imagine ah no not at all (laughs) um so in this example, like uh, if the Pirate Party came into power, there would be no permission for any telephone company to have recorded lines on all of its subjects. It really would have to be a matter of if there was a complaint made to the police about a person, then there would be, then you would allow um, surveillance of a person, but only until that stage. Yeah, that's right. Because otherwise, you just create. Well, you have the problem of everyone sort of being in public all the time or having to act like they're in public all the time. Uh, but you also have problems that the data becomes a, a 
honeypot for hackers and if you can get that sort of private data on someone you might be able to figure out their um how to get into their accounts um well especially if you can access their computers but if like just you know being able to engineer things through names and stuff like that you can find out like i think there's an example with the census when um they decided they'd collect everyone's personal census data and match it um they worked out People worked out how the code worked, and then they just started publishing um, Australian celebrities' um, <laughs> census codes. Like Malcolm Turnbull was the most favourite, yeah. uh, most favourite one of everyone to use because you know he's prime minister. But plenty of others were figured out as well. You just need the date of birth, name, and I can't remember what the detail was. Age, I suppose. I know it's date of birth. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was just a simple formula to figure out how to make the up here figure out what your own sort of access code was yeah so um this is another thing about secrets let's turn turn the whole argument so should a nation state have secrets from its people in general no there's probably very certain circumstances for very very limited times where secrets are okay but for the most part um the government should be transparent because you know, we need to make sure the government's acting in our interests and we need to ensure that we, uh, you know, if we live in a democracy, we should know what the people who are running the democracy are actually doing to make sure that it's happening how we want it to happen. And um, that sort of clear information makes democracy work better. So what about um, information that about Australia and how it defends itself that can't be just publicly broadcasted, could it? Well... During operations, things should be secret. Um, but after, like, the you know, once the thing's over, that sort of should become available. So just so everyone knows how, what the government's done. Say, like, um, missile solos of, like, how, it's def- how it could defend itself, positions of submarines. It, it surely can't provide that to the public because then that potentially could go in the hands of some enemy in the future. Um, yeah, but like, yeah, operational. I sort of think is uh, situations like, you know, sort of things that need to be kept quiet. But once things are like, you know, there needs to be a sort of delay and then things can get published. But as for, say, um, Australian operations overseas at the moment, they're really um, kind of secret. We know that Australian planes are, bomb- are doing bombing runs in Syria. We don't know anything about them. We don't know if they've ever hurt civilians. We don't know if they've hit the wrong target. Uh, we don't even know what they've blown up. And we're not allowed to know. And that kind of means they're just operating outside of the Australian public consciousness. And it's a really bad sort of place where wars are fought without people, the people paying for them and in some cases dying for them, know why or what's going on. It's just, it's very anti-democratic to to run a war like that. Should a government have a secret agency? Uh, Like, uh, so like ASIO, you mean? Yeah. I think there's probably limited need for um, counter-espionage to exist while we live in the world we live in. There's a need for sort of limited amounts of sort of uh, intelligence agencies operating to um, keep an eye on sort of the country's enemies probably needs to be done a little more openly than what it is now. Though. Yeah, and uh, I guess it, it seems to be the case that whenever you have something that's secret and outside of the public sphere, then there's there's almost like a... Um, there's tons of different cells of opinion and thought which rides within this secret agency and almost there's factions with inside that and because it it's like a, a body of government in itself inside a government but because there's, there's no scrutiny then it almost has free reign so there's a weird presence that happens within the realm of secret societies and obviously a secret isn't a if you're in a secret society it's, a, it's an occult in a sense people think it's like devil worshipping and stuff like that but it's not necessarily it's just a, a something that's keeping out of the public sphere so i guess where you're coming from in a sense as well is that if these things were a bit more part of the public domain and people would get more information about 
what Australia is doing, their public operations, then maybe that could lend itself to really Australia acting in its best interests. Yeah, that's right. Um, at the moment, sort of politicians keep that quiet and then do whatever they do um, without too much reference to what people want. I think with the, with the sort of secrecy around intelligence agencies, there's a, a Heard, like read somewhere there's the correct number of intelligence agencies to have as n plus one you always need someone to watch them the watches see, watches and then you need someone to watch them and yeah. so on up you know as far as the chain goes i suppose because the only way to provide oversight is to have someone set up to look over their shoulders yeah yeah and then you've got the, the county agents you've got the people that um you could have inserts you, there's all these different little factions as soon as almost you it's almost like as soon as I create a sword, then I'm, I've almost created a war for myself because I, the other person's going to get a sword and see, there's an escalation of both sides of the scale. So there's another interesting part. You do have a policy I've noticed on asylum seekers and refugees. Is that, is that an Australian policy or is that just a general policy for the Pirate Party? That's the Australian policy. Um, all of our policies have sort of been written in Australia. There's when we first set up, we sort of cross referenced with other parties, but sort of developed our as we sort of grown, we've developed our own. Uh, with the asylum seekers policy, we sort of think the best way to deal with because the problem is that while Australian, Australian at the moment, you know, the Australian ref, the situation for refugees in Australia is awful, and um, they should. It's nothing illegal about seeking asylum somewhere, but the people who are in the detention centres are there under the, you know, the sort of argument made by the politicians is that it's to deter people from making the dangerous sea journey. So um, our solution would be to um, set up a processing centre at like the countries, probably like you know, put one in Indonesia would be the most obvious place, but you know, uh, probably um, Malaysia would also be a good idea, sort of mainland Asia, um, where people could come to apply for refugee status in Australia without having to make the sea journey. So kind of take out the actual risk and still provide the people who want to come here with access to being able to quest a refugee. Yeah, obviously this is a massive topic now and there's a, there's a big influx of migration which is happening in Europe and things like that. Obviously, the, uh, from the other total perspective of um, refugees is the fact that people say, well, there's, there's, yeah, you might get somebody that's prosecuted by the land and they could be a, a really nice person that uh, stands up for people and the government didn't like them and they booted them out of the country or whatever, like, things like that. You, you really want to sort of protect those people. But um, uh, there's another class and it can't be just like totally ruled out you do have economic migrants as well some people obviously want to seek a better life as well and obviously australia can provide that between a, a number of countries it's probably one of the most prosperous countries in the world so what what's your opinion on those things can economic migrants get involved in this kind of thing or do you think it just should be taken in due pro process and really it should be only available for genuine refugees i think it should definitely uh, be made available for uh genuine refugees economic might like it's it's hard in some cases it's hard to know who's an economic migrant and who's a refugee should err on the side of assuming people are refugees where there's a little doubt but generally like it's a humanitarian policy rather than just a, a sort of method for economic migrants to get into the country, I think, I, was, I sort of think the um, problems are fairly overstated just as a sort of dog whistle to racists, but like I'm sure some of the refugees are just economic migrants, or some of the people that come here who are coming here by boat were just economic migrants, but the vast majority would have actually been refugees. Right. Uh, now, I'll just try and keep on uh, stepping in the, in the toes of like the like nationalist side of uh, perspective of thinking for the meantime. There's another argument as well that gets banded about to say, well, 
It's all well and good if you get a, a migrant that's uh, the, the nearest neighbouring country. Say if you've got a crisis happening in New Zealand, then yeah, it's understandable. You, they're seeking refuge in Australia. It's people that have, speak the same language, compatible, all those kind of things. Now, if you've got somebody that's uh, coming from Syria, you've got different religion, you've got different language, you've got all these different problems in terms of assimilation. What's your sort of opinion when it comes to those kind of things where people say, okay, well, why don't these people just find the nearest neighboring country to seek asylum rather than make that massive jump to Australia? Uh, in a lot of the circumstances, the neighboring country can't really deal with the people coming in. So like Turkey, for example, on the border of Syria has, uh, I think, around a million people living there currently displaced. And uh, Turkey isn't that rich, so dealing with that sort of huge amount of people is, um, would be difficult for anyone to manage, let alone a, a poorer country. Uh, and then, you know, in other sort of crisis areas, like around Afghanistan, there's, um, you know, Iran on one side and Pakistan on the other, and both of which um, aren't very well off. Um, Pakistan's got its own sort of internal problems. Iran's a bit better able to deal with it, but again, it's not a very well-off country. So they sort of do need to get out of their area quite often. Sure. All right, and then I'll just uh, throw in one more just into the mix. I know your party is not necessarily all about asylum seekers, but it's, it's, an, it's a very important thing that's happening right now in today's age. Um, and I think it does definitely need to be spoken about. But um, I guess with your party, it's all about proportional representation, people having democratic rights and people getting a say um, and participating in their government. Now, say for majority of towns, majority of communities, to say to them, if there was a vote or a vote ballot to the, a, a community or a town to say, would you be happy to accept these refugees from whatever country? And they're, they're not a closely linked country to Australia at all. What would you think the majority of those towns or villages or small small communities would say in that situation? Honestly, I think a lot of them would really like it. There's uh, the situation where a lot of Afghani refugees are uh, li quite living quite happily in Yang because they had uh, a lot of work for I think it was uh, um, abattoirs and they couldn't find many um, locals that wanted to do the work and group of asylum seekers moved there and started working there. They've integrated quite well because they've, they go in, because they've gone in as a group. They've got their own sort of social support networks. Everyone in the town likes them because they are you know, working, they're contributing, they're you know, also rebalancing with the drift of people's uh, habit, like people living in the country's habit of moving to cities. Um, so I think like it, it, there's a lot of the thing would go quite well, actually. It'd be different in different places, obviously, but I think a lot of places would be uh, quite open to them. So um, would the Pirate Party say that communities should have a choice in uh, refugees joining their community? People should be free to live where they want. Um, it'd be ideal for refugees to live where in areas where there's enough services, but generally we don't think people should be told where to live. All right, so... Um, uh... Thanks for covering all of that. <laughs> I've given you all the, um, the awkward questions to the end. So uh, are there any other interesting policies that the Pirate Party has been putting out there that I've, um, I've skipped over? We support a universal basic income is probably our, um, one of our sort of uh, newer policies that people have thought was a really good idea. Where We sort of work that way. Um, it's, uh, it's all different models. I'm not sure if you've talked about it on your show at all. Um, the way we do it is you just set it up with a everyone would be granted uh, I mean it's $15,000 a year as the base rate and then you just pay that off at the tax rate from your earnings so um, it just your tax you know the tax just starts straight away and it eats away at your $15,000 until it gets to zero uh, which is about $40,000 a year so it's only after $40,000 a year you start paying income tax but we think that would be really good to um, just get rid of the burdens of people and welfare and the constant government looking over your shoulder all the meetings or um, kind of pressure to get jobs that may not 
necessarily be there. And like this is sort of part of the reason we think this is important is as uh, automation increases, there will just be less work. So we need some sort of actual social safety net that's set for everyone. And even if you can't find work, there's not the constant fear of being cut off, the constant fear of something being homeless. There's the sort of platform under everyone. Right. Oh, um, Elon Musk uh, shares your views. He mentioned that before on an interview to say that there's uh, so much scope for AI technology that all the mundane jobs in the world uh, look to be made redundant now, or the people that are doing those jobs are going to looking to be made redundant in the maybe 10-year uh, scope, 20-year scope probably more likely. So there is that argument. What about the argument to say, well, if you give people the luxury of thinking that they've got that basic income, why, uh, you know how people are, they just, uh, they'll try and work out the system that works best for themselves. Like uh, there's opportunists in the out there, they'll just try and work a way to live off proceeds of the minimum wage and just bum around. Do you think that that it, it might start that kind of prevalence in society to say, okay, well, uh, if I can just get around with that that basic income, then my life will be pretty sweet. Well, automation's going to kind of make bums of us all, I think. So I think it's kind of just uh, old school Protestant work ethic kind of banging up against modern reality. And also, I think part of the part of the reason it won't be much of a problem whilst we don't have serious automation is that people just don't like being that poor some people will and some people might just bludge but that's perfectly fine because then people who want to work will have access to the job that someone who doesn't really doesn't really want to work kind of has to take otherwise and uh, there's another argument as well out there to say that it's not just like we're going to just be these um, buffoons and this ai technology is just going to take over there's an argument to say that we and the technology are going to be more combined. If you think about uh, your mobile phone, we're we're almost um, connected so in so many ways to the world with the mobile phone, and that device is always in our hand or not too far away from our body. So you could take a couple of leaps forward in the future to say that if this artificial intelligence that is out there why don't we adapt ourselves to have the artificial intelligence plus the biology of the human? I think, well, it's certainly, I mean, the mobile phone just changes the way people manage information and stuff. Um, certainly potential for uh, sort of augmented intelligence. I'm not much of an expert on it. Um, <laughs> As I understand, you're not an expert in the field. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I think it's interesting. I think people, you know, have just change what it means to be human, and this is something we're just going to have to deal with as sort of things progress. That's society. Okay. Um. And uh, yeah, is there anything else that uh, on the uh, beyond the universal income as well? We have a wide range of policies to cover a lot of things. Where, but I think this sort of the main ones is we've discussed um yeah universal basic income is the sort of big one that stands out outside of our sort of traditional sphere yeah so i do talk a lot of the time about the blockchain how that may revolutionize a lot of how we manage our affairs have you um delved into that at all as a party some of our members are quite involved in various sort of blockchain projects and stuff Sort of something that like a lot of people are keeping abreast of. I've like I read up on bits and pieces here and there. So I think there's got a lot of potential for managing sort of transactions and yeah, I guess time will tell how useful it'll all be. Yeah, because uh, we, well, another thing with uh, blockchain technology is obviously is people have found that obviously you can use Bitcoin or cryptocurrency as a means to exchange value, but then there's I'm trying to push on a little bit more onto the theory to say that maybe you can use mechanized money or the, the, the system of money to provide social goods. So you can code in a system or an environment for people to work within. So um, I've provided examples before in the past where 
basically if you create a system which provides a distributed ledger so it gives a reward to people that are acting in that environment there's hard-coded rules say for example uh, you, you know about like light emission in cities there's too much light emission in cities and you can't see the stars in the night sky you could have a environment system working there to get the actors in there like the miners to block off um, light sources and then there could be like satellite systems to look down at those people to see that they're working in the community and they're stopping the light admission they get a reward kickback and then that's a monetary system people believe in that money more and more and then some people say okay well that's a good charitable cause i would like to own more of those coins myself and then there's this kind of like uh, decentralizing crowdfunding network voluntary uh, currencies which work and it doesn't need to stop there on just light admission it can work for a health can work for a lot of the, the operations of what government could be and yeah it's a role of decentralizing the government so it only you almost can get to a core of what the government is of like law and defense and even law is up grabs as well when it comes to blockchain technology in the respect of not requiring any trusted party in the transaction but i would think that the pirate party would have definitely uh, be thinking about some of the policies in the future with that technology one of our uh, it guys andrew who um has been trying to look into working on voting systems is quite interested in a lot of the blockchain stuff he have like You'd probably talk to you for hours about that stuff. <laughs> um, I sort of keep abreast, like read a bit, read up on it a bit here and there. But when I like, I can, de- like I can see its value, and particularly well, sort of Bitcoin's obvious. Being able to use it for uh, like other way, like voting, seems like a fairly good idea once the trust is there. Because with voting, the trust is like everything really, and once there's enough trust those sort of things would be quite useful for you know everything really but yeah yeah the trust has to come first yeah exactly and uh, yeah the the mass uh, adoption of something as well because obviously if you think about what's going on in society today you've got the the private corporate sector doing deals which are not in public scrutiny with the government and nobody knows what's going on there's always these backhand deals and the government starts to issue more bonds that's what's happening with the airport right now so the new airport in sydney so it's it's a messy dodgy affair but to have a open transparent ledger which could have some kind of uh marketplace to say okay you want to build a road this is the contract who can offer to build this road under these circumstances for the lowest price and uh, the public funding's there, all these different private companies bid for the contract, and everyone sees what's going on, there's no shady deals. That kind of stuff really can change the way the system works, and there's less of the middle band taking their slice in the system. And I just, um, yeah, I definitely really would love to see a lot more from uh, the Pirate Party, because I do see them as a very technological based political party and i'd love to get them really uh, involved in that as well so simon what are your ambitions for the party is it like just for the next general election and maybe for the next uh, 10 years we hope to have by the next general election have our state branches set up and just run you know run candidates in our all states for active and I just want to create a bigger share of the vote for the next election. By 10 years, I hope we'd have people in Parliament, if not the Senate, then at least the state upper houses or local council governments, both of which are a fair bit easier than the federal parliament to get into. Right. And just is that a a very big leap that you need to get from where you are right now in, in terms of votes? To get into... To get into the Senate is a huge increasing votes because the current senate is about 14.3 percent to get in the half senate election which last one was a double disillusion so it was seven but generally it's 14.3 percent we got points about 0.6 in the states we ran right so yeah we've got a long way to go 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, best of luck to you anyway, Simon. Um, where can people find more about your cause? Our website's pirateparty.org.au. We have all of our information there. We've got a discussion board for anyone that has any questions. IRC channels, which uh, people uh, in 24 hours a day, although the conversation's sometimes a bit sporadic. Um, we've got our sort of Twitter and Facebook accounts as well. We try to keep active on social media. Okay, and uh, I hear you're a bit of an artist as well, aren't you? Or a musician? Yeah, yeah, I'm a musician. Okay, well, what, what music are you producing? Um, I produce uh, electronic music mainly. Um, I have just put out an EP or it's, um, for free on uh, SoundCloud. It's on, under the name uh, AK Fru, F-R-U, uh, A-K-F-R-U. And yeah, so... Uh, I spend way too much time doing politics to promote myself properly. But um, all right, well, I'll put some links in below um, comment section so uh, people can find find out about the other stuff that you do as well. Anyway, so you're not fully devoted into the political world. Yeah, yeah, I would like to do music and not do politics, but I'm. I can't help myself, really. <laughs> You're just going to work with the market, unfortunately. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for that, Simon. I will um, be in touch with you, and uh, best of luck to the uh, Pyro Party. Yeah, thanks for having me.